Dr. Gilson, go ahead and take it away. <laughs> um, so I'm Nancy Gilson. I am the director, um, I mean, the administrative director of the International Studies Program. Um, and because ISP has the oldest of the five-year programs, I'm also the person, and, and I'm the director of academic programs for the School of Global Policy and Strategy for the graduate side. So I'm, I'm, the, I'm the sort of person in both places that oversees the five-year programs. Um, the BA MIA with, with International Studies, which has three tracks. Uh, the BA MPP that took its first admissions, its first um, people into the program this year. And now the BA MIA with uh, the Political Science Department that'll have its first applications this year. Um, so we're sort of, you know, we're we're moving along and sort of rocking things here by by growing these programs. So uh, first of all, let me thank you all for coming and for your interest in the program and start out with the offer if I haven't met with you to make an appointment with me. Um, there's a slide at the end um, that has my email address. Send me an email, make an appointment. Um, uh, Aaron, Amy, Natalie, you want to introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Erin Mori. I'm one of the advisors for the International Studies Program. So I've worked with a lot of the students that are in ISP applying to the BAMA program. Uh, Amy, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Amy Blitzotti. I'm the intake advisor at GPS. And Amy's the, our technological wizard. So questions like when will it, you know, is it recorded and when will it be posted is all up to Amy. Natalie? Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Eicher and I'm the undergrad advisor for the Department of Political Science. So um, let's get started. We're gonna introduce you in a little bit to one of the um, admissions uh, staff at GPS. Um, uh, and I'll introduce her in a second when, when she's gonna show you what the application actually looks like, but let, let's, let's sort of get started with the, the, the um, beginning stuff. Um, so Marina will show you the application in a minute, but this is the sort of basic information here about where you can find the application. Um, uh, and you can get to it uh, directly from uh, the GPS admissions website. You can get to it from uh, ISP if you're a BA MIA student. You can get to it from the political science side if you're a political science student. And it's also, um, there's also a link on the economics um, department site under the BA MPP. So there are lots of ways to get to it, um, or you can just copy it down here and put it into your browser and, um, and, and get there. So this is, um, this is an application workshop for the programs in the BA MIA um, International Affairs. So, um, uh, pay attention here, um, you know, to the change in uh, in uh, in degree codes um, when you uh, uh, when you're applying. So, BA MIA program in international affairs, um, the political science, the 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 bachelor's of international affairs and political science, and the BA MPP. Those are the new degree codes. Um, and when you and it, Marina will explain this better. But when you actually apply, you're going to be, the, the application is going to prompt you to apply for fall 2022. And the reason is because you're applying to a graduate program and that will be your first quarter of actual graduate student standing. Um, and so it's kind of weird because you're applying, you're going to be in the program next year, but you'll still be undergraduates. So you're actually applying to your graduate year the deadline for the application is April 10th, so lots of time. But you know, as we always tell you, don't wait until the very last minute um, because then if something goes wrong for some reason, uh, it's sort of difficult uh, to correct things um, on a Saturday evening. Staff is not looking at um, uh, the deadline at that point. Um, so you know, just pay close attention. You have plenty of opportunity to ask questions about the application and the application material.
Um, so this is this this gives you just the 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 bare minimum here. Um, uh, the application interface and Marina's going to show you that in a minute. So that's where you go to actually, you know, press the button and apply. Um, you'll need a statement of purpose, a resume, um, two recommendations, and um, please take note that if your uh, referee is from UCSD, let them know that they don't need to write a letter. It's just a it's an online ranking form, um, and uh, you know they can, they can submit a letter if they want to, but it's optional. So two recommendations. Uh, and transcripts from UCSD. And uh, if you are a transfer student, the community colleges that you attended, or if you attended another four-year university, those transcripts as well. Marina, do you wanna, do we wanna let Marina jump in here? Hey everyone, thank you for uh, being here with us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to take you through um, thank you for the intro, Nancy, and thank you for talking about the application components. Um, but let me go ahead and just share with you my screen so you can see what it looks like when you get to the website to um, actually begin your application to one of the BA programs. Um, so the first thing you're going to land upon, and I just want to make sure everybody can see my screen, this is the Graduate Division website. Thank you, Erin. Um, you can also access this grad application from Graduate Division. So grad .ucsd.edu, that's another place that you can access the application. So what you're gonna do, if you haven't already um, started an application is first you register, you get your password and everything situated and then you're able to log in. Once you log in, it's going to take you to a page where you can see I've got plenty of applications started. I just can't decide where, when I want to go to school and where which program I wanna get into. So. Let me just go ahead and pull an application. So I'm going to start an application. Actually, let me just start from the beginning, start a new application. Okay, here I go. So I am going to say, oh, one thing about that. Um, it will ask you a, a couple of questions in the beginning. So it's going to ask you if you're a current UCSD student, it's gonna ask you which college you're attending. It's gonna ask you for your PID, all these things. And that enables you to select, once you enter that bit of information, it allows you to select a program in the BA, MIA, MPP realm. So once you select the program that is appropriate for the, the program that which, you know, whichever degree program that you're interested in applying, that is how you are gonna access the application and you're all going to select fall of 22. If you, at the very earliest, you will be looking at fall 22. So when you get there, you're going to see lots of these, all these different tabs. And um, again, program selector. Are you a current student at UC San Diego? Yes. And then you start filling in all these bits of information, degree type, BAMIA -A -A or BAMPP, they're right at the top. So if you don't see these two, when you come down to degree type, then you probably submit completed some information up here incorrectly. So just be methodical, take your time, get through that and continue on. There's various bits of information that personal information that they'll take you through. So go ahead and fill um, in what, what you would like to share with uh, the grad division. Um, and then that this is the place where you will upload your required application elements. So after you list your academic history, from there you can upload your test scores. There's also, um, for the BA MIA, just to, as a reminder, there are no uh, standardized tests that are required. Common questions or the questions that pertain to the BA MIA and BA MPP. From there, you will um, add your recommenders. So you're going to add various recommenders. You're going to list. They will show you. You will ask, be prompted for information. You'll go ahead and um, go ahead and fill out this information. As soon as you do this, this will send a prompt to your recommender informing them that they are have been named by you 
to complete a letter of recommendation and or to and will be given a link to upload. So as you fill out this information, once you have secured your red, uh, letter of recommendation writers, go ahead. This is pretty instant. So just make sure that you follow up with them as soon as you send that, um, add them to the system and let them know that a link has been sent their way. Check their junk mail if they don't see it in their inbox. It will be sent um, immediately. So don't let it go too long so they can find that link and hold on to it where you'll submit your statement of purpose. All the links you can see on the side here, wherever you need to go. Um, if you are looking for fee waivers, um, the, the Grad Division website has information on processing fee waivers. So um, please follow those directions. If you have any other questions about the fee waiver process, feel free to, um, or have any other questions about submitting your application, feel free that are outside of the requirements um, that you will go over with um, Nancy and her team. Um, feel free to contact us and or me and I'll be happy to field any questions you might have, um, help you through any technical difficulties you're having your, on your application, etc. Erin, you want to go back to the slides? Okay. Okay, so as you saw when uh, Marina showed you um, the application, um, you have here the this the essays for the for the application. And um, if you've been to one of the info sessions in the past, you know that we will have a an info session specifically on the statement of purpose essays. And if you choose to do the supplemental essay, how to write those, how to think about them, they are different from the one that you wrote when you applied to UCSD. Um, uh, and I think in some ways they're easier to write, uh, but the hardest thing about uh, a statement of purpose is always just like putting a word down on the blank screen and then going from there. And so we'll talk about them. So. Your statement of purpose is basically a statement of your professional objectives in international affairs or public policy. In other words, what are you interested in? When did you become interested in it? That when might be because of how you grew up or where you grew up or a class that you took or someone that you knew had a really cool job working for a nonprofit or working in the government. It could be that you went to, you did a year abroad or you spent some time living abroad. In other words, we're not looking for some kind of deep, profound, middle of the night awakening of wanting to go off and work for the UN and saving the world. We're really looking at your interest in, um, uh, you know, in, in what you're going to be doing in the graduate program, which is studying policy, studying either public policy or international affairs policy, and like where did that interest come from? We assume that you're applying to the program because these are things that you're interested in. So where did they come from? What have you done to kind of to encourage that interest? Have you taken internships in the area? Have you taken courses um, uh, that that have kind of fostered that interest? Did you go abroad and spend some time uh, working in a particular way? Did you do an internship abroad? Uh, why do you want to get a master's of international affairs? Or why do you want to get a master's of public policy? In other words, what do you think, like, what do you want to be, if you will, when you grow up, you know, as we say, like, what, in when you think about the job you want to have, it's going to make you happy for the first, let's say, 10 years after you get out of the master's degree, what does that job look like? And so we're looking for the sort of development of your interest in this thing and where it lands you once you get outside of school. Um, we're also interested in, you know, sort of additional educational experiences. So co-curricular stuff, if you are involved in um, some of the student groups that uh, on campus, you have a leadership role or you've coached peewee soccer or you've led the choir at your church or you've you know you spend time donating your time doing things um, in your community um adversity that you've had to overcome um 
uh, social justice work or social justice interests that you that that you've been involved in, um, or uh, a sort of you know ethical commitments you've decided a long time ago that you wanted to be in, involved with uh, human rights issues or Doctors Without Borders or advocates for you know better public schooling. These are the kinds of things that we want to know about you in your statement of purpose. And in your supplemental essay, the supplemental essay is not required. Um, it's where you tell us about tell us about things that you think we should know about you that are not covered in the formal and required part of the application. So that can be really helpful for us to get to know you, to see you more fully. Um, I suggest that you use the supplemental essay to also say things like. I came in as a freshman, I spent a year as a physics major, I got crappy grades, and then I transferred into political science and discovered that this was my real thing. And so you're gonna look at my transcript and see a bunch of crappy grades. But as soon as I took a class on the international relations between the United States and Europe, I was on fire. And, and so those are the kinds of things that you could tell us you know, in your supplemental essay. Nancy. Yes, ma'am. I just want to do, um, I don't, I know that we didn't cover this beforehand, but we don't have a, an option in this new application system for the supplemental essay. So okay. under uh, under the additional educational experiences, okay. there are different, there are places there where people can talk about um, those very things, leadership, social, social justice, adversities, okay. things okay. that they've overcome. So they might find space within those areas, within those prompts in the application okay. to um, address any issue, maybe, um, as you in, in indicated, okay. why they okay. might have changed over. Okay. All right. Oh, that's new. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Your resume. Um, so, as this says, you know, we, we know that you are all undergraduates. Now, some of you who are transfer students may have in fact spent some time right out of high school or while you were in, you know, in community college or between community college and applying to UCSD, you might have spent some time um, working, but we 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 don't expect undergraduates to have, you know, five page resumes that have um, you know, that you spent a year as a loan officer in a bank and, and so on. Um, so, but we are interested, we still want you to talk first of all about your employment. Um, we want you to talk about what, even if it's part-time employment or volunteer positions, internships, the things that are listed here. And the reason that we want you to do that is um, because it tells us, you know, that you know what what it likes to be. What when you come into GPS in particular, we can talk to you about what it's like to find a job, to hold a job, to get up every day and be someplace, to answer to somebody, to have a supervisor. Um, it gives us a sense of, uh, you know, your sort of commitment to hard work. And so, you know, your resume. We don't expect it to be the resume of a 35-year-old. We expect it to be a, a resume of someone who's between 20 and 30. Okay, so don't you know? Don't feel like you have to, um, you know, sort of make stuff up. Heather, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I was just kind of wondering: um, Does GPS prefer resumes or are uh, can we do like a CV or is there? You can you can do a CV. I mean, most of you probably don't have, uh, you know, the difference between the two, one is a one is really a professional resume that, that focuses on work history. Typically a CV is an academic resume um, that also has, if you have a lot of research or publications, you can do it either way. Um, uh, you know, I changed the language on here to talk about a resume because most most undergraduates don't really have enough uh, to put on it, um, so that it's actually sort of an you know a professional um, uh, CV that that academics have. But but you can do it either way if you know what a CV is and you what you've worked with and you've used. That's fine. No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, excuse me, sorry, really quick. Sure, um, yeah. Is this, um, 
do we have the general like one page limit or no for us? I mean some okay. of some of you've done some of you've done a lot of cool stuff. Um, and so I, you know, I don't I don't want to say, you know, take that step off because you have to you can only have one one page. Okay, thank you. Wen Jin? Uh, yes, uh, I had a question because uh, you just talk about the educational experiences. I feel that like there will be something similar to what I'm gonna write in the resume. So how yep. can I differentiate them? You mean your 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 um, the difference between your essay and your resume? Uh, between actually like between the education. I mean your resume and your and your essay. Go ahead. The, I actually want to mean the resume and the educational experience. Um, so, the, I mean, they might, you know, a resume is really a listing. Um, a discussion of your educational experience is going to, is going to help us, you know, understand your experience from your position, from your perspective and what you, you know, wh what you learned along the way, the way it changed the way that you think about what you want to do, right? So a resume typically is not narrative. When you talk, when when you answer questions about your educational experience, typically that's going to be more narrative. Okay, thank you. Of course. So recommendations. Um, you only need two recommendations. Um, you don't need more. More is not necessarily better. Two good ones from people who know you that write strong recommendations really is, the, that's sufficient. Um, so you'll notify your res, your referees, you'll, you will send them a personal email. Going through the dance, will they write you a letter? Ex you'll explain to them the program that you're, you're applying to. If they're me, for example, when I have students come to me and ask me to write letters, I want them to tell me why do they want to, you know, why that program and what do they want to do when they get out of it so that I can write a letter or in even in the, you know, even in the, um, the ranking system online, if you're, you know, when you're allowed to say something more, you know what someone wants to, you know what someone wants to do. But particularly if someone is insisting on writing you a letter, it helps them know something about what your expectations are, right? So you'll send them an email, explain to them what you want, what you want to do, and then you will put their information in the system and, and a prompt is automatically and really almost immediately sent to your referees. Um, and then they will go in on their own and, and do your recommendations, right? Um, it's, a, it's very simple for them. Uh, uh, a lot of programs have now gone to the online ranking systems that, that sort of prompt them to think about um, your work ethic, uh, uh, you know, whether you've, you know, whether they've seen you work um, in groups and how collegial you are in leadership and those kinds of things. Okay, so you want someone who can, who knows you. That makes a, that, that's a strong reference. Someone who really does know you, okay, and can, and can speak to you direct, can speak about you directly. If, if you have someone who's going to write you a letter, it must be in English and it has to be submitted directly by the recommender. It doesn't go to you and then you submit it, okay? Um, and so it goes directly in the online application system after receiving the prompt from the system, right? And when you put that information in the system, uh, it has to have complete contact information. And if your letter writer is going to write a letter for you, um, then, then that letter typically has who they are, how we can get in contact with them. I don't think in all the years, and I've written a lot of letters of recommendation that an institution has ever come back to me and said, hey, can you talk to us about this person? Um, uh, unless, I, I can't, I've written hundreds of letters, um, but, but we wanna know who the person is that's, that's writing you the recommendation. Who had a question? Song, did you have a question? Um, yes, for the type of people who write your recommendations, uh -huh. um, is a former boss better than a professor or is there like a preference between the two? Um, 
there's not a preference between the two, but I guess I would say, um, uh, you know, again, it's a, it's a question of how well they know you and how well they can speak to your work ethic, um, the timeliness of your work, how well you accept supervision as this, you know, this slide talks to you about what's, who's a good reference. So for example, if, you know, if, if, if you have, if you've, worked a job or you've done an internship and this is someone who can really speak to your qualities as a as an employee and as someone who got there every day and did the work and asked questions and took supervision well versus the only faculty member you know is someone who was in a class of of you know 200 people and it was math 10c and you took it three years ago then then certainly in that sense a boss or a supervisor is a better is is a better reference for you thank you <laughs> okay are there any other questions about that uh yeah uh so for the uh contact information do we must include the person's phone number telephone number or the email would be enough? The online application requests uh, their name, title, institution, as well as uh, contact, email contact. I don't believe they're looking for a phone number. Yeah, I, I think when I've, when I've gotten prompts, um, uh, a phone number, a work phone number can be put in, but it's not a required field. Okay. The required fields are the ones that are more identifiers, name, title, institution, email address. And then it might also, I think it's also a required field usually to how long someone has known you and in what capacity. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I know this is a hard one for you guys, asking for a letter of recommendation, reference. It always, it sucks. It's always hard because you feel like you're asking someone to do something that's sort of above and beyond. But faculty are supposed to write you letters. That's part of the relationship that you have with them. Supervisors and internships should know that that's what you're going to do. So don't be apologetic in asking someone for a letter. It's part of the job, okay? Our job is to make sure that you move forward in your life given the relationship we've had with you in the classroom. So when a student comes to me and asks for a letter of recommendation, the only time I say no is if I can't write a strong letter. Otherwise, I always say yes. I think it's part of my obligation as someone who's in the classroom. Manuel? Um, for a UCSD faculty member, it doesn't have to be a professor at UCSD. It could be somebody working in like, for example, the alumni office. Yep. Okay, thank you. Heather, you have another question? Um, yeah, so I'm planning on asking um, my, uh, I'm part of a research team and a graduate student is the research instructor. I was hoping to ask him for a letter of recommendation. Is that something we can do? The, the, the research instructor is a PhD student? Yeah, uh, I think he's a PhD candidate to be yeah, okay. specific. Yeah. We, we know that um, uh, particularly in large classes or if you're working in a lab that sometimes your PI is going to be um, an advanced PhD student. And um, uh, you know, we, we expect that they're going to be, that, that some of the references are going, to, are going to come from advanced PhD students. Okay, great, thank you. You know, that's that's much more helpful than someone says, uh, yeah, they're on my list, right? Yeah. They're, they're on my class list, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, then the other, the last thing here is the thing with the asterisks, which is make sure that you give people plenty of time. A student that I know really well that comes to me and wants a, needs a letter in three or four days, I'll kind of breathe hard and then say, yes, I'll do it. But but asking someone to do, to be, it's a lot easier with the online ranking system because you don't spend a couple hours crafting a good letter, but nonetheless, like doing the ranking system well and seriously and not feeling put out, faculty feel put out, but they still, you know, they're still supposed to do these things. 
So give someone plenty of time. Don't spring it on them the day before. It also means that your application doesn't get held up in any way, right? And you have to chase them down and that's always awkward. I think, can I just um, jump in real yeah. quick? That is like the number one reason your application doesn't move forward. It's because yeah. your letters of recommendation haven't been received. So reaching out to your recommenders with plenty, plenty of time and there's nothing wrong with February, maybe early March, to reach out to them, to ask them, give them time to procrastinate, give them time to you know get around to it finally. And then following up with them, of course, if they haven't done it in a time frame which you would like to, you can't submit your application, but you just need to keep monitoring it mm -hmm. to ensure that those letters have been received. There's nothing wrong with following up with them and asking them to get those in. If they need that uh, link to be sent again, we're more than happy to do that. Mm -hmm. And then of course you wanna thank them afterwards. After they've submitted that letter of recommendation, you wanna thank them for their time and attention to your application. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Um, Marina, do you want to talk about transcripts? Sure, thanks. So during the application process, um, one of the things that you're going to do on your application is list your academic history. And the other thing um, you're going to do is provide proof of that academic history. And that proof is actually going to be, or the record is going to be your transcripts. So the transcripts that you can um, upload for the application process will be tra current transcripts in the program. They can be unofficial. You can download your academic history on Triton link and provide us that information and upload it. Um, if you have um, previously attended a community college, please include that information. So I believe that UC San Diego has a pretty good transcript where coursework that was taken or completed at a community college or other academic institutions beforehand. That yep. is included. And as long as it's got grades, the units and the grades and the name of the institution appears on your UC San Diego version, your academic transcript. And again, it can be unofficial. That is fine. That is all we're looking for for review purposes. It is not until uh, we can we can get into other details at a later point in time, but you do need to upload your transcripts um, and they can be unofficial. You can obtain them from Triton link. Um, if you're a transfer student or attended other academic institutions and your um, history does not appear on the, uh, and you can always contact me for, for clarification. If it doesn't appear the way I just explained it should, then uh, contact me and we can talk about it and I can give you further or steps or um, yeah, we can go ahead and take a look and see whether or not that will work for review purposes. Okay, thank you. Do we have a preference if it includes their winter grades or not? Um, I don't know that, well, sorry, Nance, go ahead. Yeah, so I think um, the application isn't due until April. Um, and so um, I think it's great if you can, um, like do everything else and then upload your transcript last so it has winter grades. Um, most of you will are taking things in winter that will be relevant to our review. And, um, and so having more grades is better than having fewer. And um, particularly, you know, for those of you who are, you know, if, um, if, if you're, a transfer student in your second year or you're a, you came in as a freshman and you were around last spring and so we've had these three quarters of of just sort of confusion on campus a more complete set of grades is just is better um, as i say you're taking classes that are relevant to our review and and you know i'd like to see those grades so I just have it be the last thing that you that you submit Troy, you have a question? Yeah, um, just a quick one. Um, so I think uh, at least the policy department uh, announced yesterday that they would be allowing people to do uh, pass and pass. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the review, would it matter if it was, um, if we did pass and pass classes um, this quarter? Um, so, you know, we're going to look at your GPAs. Um, we're going to look at your major GPA, and we're going to look at your uh, cumulative GPA. And we tend to look at those 
um, uh, you know, fairly clear eyed. In other words, the cumulative GPA is a 3.0. And the, and the major GPA is, is 3.4. And if you're not at a 3.4 and you've got, a, you've got you know, a, a bunch of um, pass, no pass grades, then, then, you know, it's gonna be hard for us to assess your ability to do the work. Um, and, you know, if you're a transfer student and this, is your, and, and this is your first year and you've taken all of your courses pass, no pass, then you know, then then we don't have a GPA to look at. So so I think a lot of it is you looking hard at at um, uh, what you know how many how many P grades you have, what your what your GPA is, what your what your major GPA is, um, and say and asking yourself how we're going to look at it. I, I can't I can't deny you that ability since you're an undergraduate and you're applying to a program. Um, that you may or may not get into. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to tell you, oh, you must take everything for a letter grade. Um, but, but the rest of the record has to be strong. And I have to be able to look at it and say, in upper division work, in the area that's relevant to the application and to the, and to the work at GPS, I need to be convinced and admissions needs to be convinced that you can do the work. Okay. Remember, we don't have any scores, right? The GRE is not required. Um, and so all we, all we have is your coursework and your GPAs. Okay. Is, that, is everybody good on that? Okay. Um, so now you, you've applied, now what? Um, you'll get, you will be notified via email um, by mid-May. You will hear probably from Marina. She's the one who typically handles um, uh, the direct notifications uh, on, the, on the program. And then um, you, and, and we do that notification prior to enrollment for fall classes so that you have the ability to, uh, to enroll in the right classes. And then at that point, we're going to, you know, if you apply and you're admitted and then you have to enroll in fall, then I'm going to need to sit down um, with every one of you and, and in, you know, sort of in triangulating with the advisors in your departments to make sure that we have an enrollment strategy for you. Because since you're still undergraduates, you have a first pass, second pass thing. Since you're gonna be in your senior year, if you still have coursework left for your major, we've gotta make sure that you're in that. So once you're admitted, you'll get an email. Marina will send you an email saying, hooray. Um, what used to be the thick envelope is now just an email. Um, then you'll get an email probably from me saying, okay, now we need to talk about what you have remaining. Um, and some of you, um, uh, in ISP and in uh, political science may be required to do summer prep because you don't have economics on your transcript, because you don't have enough methods on your transcript, or you have grades um, uh, that are sort of hard for us to decipher about your abilities. And so all of that will come to you um, immediately following uh, your notification of admission. Summer prep is in the is in August between your junior and senior year. Um, this is not meant to be um, punitive. Uh, out of the you know the two hundred say um, two year um, degree program students that we admit, um, about eighty percent of them end up going to summer prep. Uh, so it's a big program. It's a way to come in to meet people that you're going to be sitting in classes with in the fall. It's a preview of the economics and the methods classes um, in the fall curriculum. So it's actually a pretty good thing to do. Um, and, and then one last thing to understand. So going back to that point about you're applying for fall 2022. So your admission to graduate standing is actually provisional. That's why you're actually applying to the graduate year though you're going to spend another year as an undergraduate. So, so graduating and matriculating into graduate standing, doing the second year of the, of the program and earning the master's degree 
requires that you'd complete the GPS core in good standing. Good standing for graduate students is a 3.0, so B grades in the core, okay? Um, at the end of, the, of your senior year, if you manage that, um, uh, and I expect that you all will, um, uh, you'll be notified of your nomination to graduate student standing. Then there's some monkey business that has to do with resubmitting your application. Marina will let you know about that when the time is appropriate. Um, and, and, and then you'll be formally um, made into a graduate student, okay? So there's a lot that happens very soon after uh, you get the notice that you've been admitted to the program. And then you really have to pay attention to making advising um, appointments and making sure that you're enrolled in the right things, okay? Are there questions about that? Anybody? Next. Um, you know, here's where we are. Um, if you want to begin early, sort of becoming involved with, um, uh, with GPS, um, in particular, I would say, you know, the Instagram stuff, it'll, they're doing, students are doing takeovers of the, of the, um, the GPS, um, Instagram, the, the student affairs Instagram. And so you get to see who some of those students are. You get to see programming. Um, the GPS Career Services uses their Instagram page to also talk about jobs and um, in uh, meetings with alumni and uh, panels that are being done. And so there's tons of material um, and places for you to find out. Uh, in addition to the GPS um, uh, page uh, website, uh, you know, at UCSD to see all of the things that are going on, all of the programs, the panels, um, different kinds of things in which you can get engaged. And then this is the person, this is the um, information on the personal statement workshop, uh, when this will be, and this is really going to be, uh, you know, sort of walking through um, uh, what uh, a good personal statement looks like and answering questions and giving you some advice like don't submit your personal statement without somebody else having read it, um, uh, making sure that it has you know no typos, uh, um, you know that it's really kind of answered the question that you've been asked, and so on. And so we'll really walk through the personal statement, so you don't have that those moments uh, that everybody has when they're writing a personal statement of I don't know what to say. Okay. Uh, so here's how you get a hold of, um, uh, uh, you know, the departments and me and um, the GPS admissions team. As uh, you know, you should be, if you're in international studies, you should be keeping up with uh, your requirements, political science, um, VAC and talking to Natalie Eicher um, in economics. Um, uh, Jennifer Beauchamp can help you over there. You can email me directly. Uh, and make an appointment with me to talk about your requirements in political science, excuse me, in economics or other coursework that you could be doing uh, to prepare for GPS or you just want to talk about the program. And if you have, certainly if you have questions about the application, um, uh, you should reach out to the GPS admissions team and Marina has just put her email address uh, in the chat. And really we, you know, um, this is not like when you applied to uh, UCSD, a real person is at the end of these email addresses and will reply to you um, and you know, wants to help you with your application and help you get admitted to the program and choose the right set of courses, okay? Are there other questions? Like unmute yourself and just ask. 